So I'm Anne McKeown and I'm the End Life Care Coordinator and Vivian is our Bereavement Liaison Officer in GUH. And our QI was we devised, developed, uh, executed a study day for supporting our end of life care champions. And here in GUH, we've had champions for just over two years now, but we, Vivian and I kind of felt we needed to gumption them all together so that everybody was on the same page. And this was one of the aims of our project that we'd bring them all together so that they would kind of network together and all be um, aiming for the same goal. I suppose there was also the issue of um, our staff skill mix. We have, through various reasons, through retirement and people being promoted, we've lost a lot of the senior staff on the clinical floor. So the, the, the knowledge base on the clinical floor isn't what it was in times past. And we wanted to um, help our champions to role model to their colleagues and particularly the junior colleagues and the MDT. Um, so we would often hear of good practice, but also when practice isn't as good as it should be. And so from kind of, well, I can't think of the word, but kind of folklore, you know, hearsay, we knew there was issues. And I suppose from our personal experience, we also knew there was issues. And some of that was around the information that staff had in relation to the other the role of other staff involved in end of life care. So they knew what to do at the bedside, but what happened before and after that wasn't always clear. And I suppose the other thing, uh, one of the other things is that we have um, had huge change in cultural diversity, both of our service users and of our staff. So we wanted to try and um, develop, you know, let everybody know what our expected standard of care was in relation to GUH and that that's what we were trying to promote. Um, we had good support from our senior management. And one of the things that came up when we um, submitted our initial application was we had um, said we wanted to give our champions a badge, a badge to be worn that would clearly identify them to other staff within the hospital as the role model, as the person who had a bit of knowledge who would help you. Um, we were questioned on that and we were adamant we weren't doing it without the badge. Um, the badge itself proved its own problems and we'll come to that later on. But actually, if we were to start again, we would definitely go with the badge. It was part of it. And I think for our attendees, it did make a formalization um, of what the day was rather than the search that goes into the back of a drawer somewhere. Uh, the project team was Vivian and I together with Sharon Fahey, who is one of our ADONs and also co-chair of our End Life Care Committee. So we initially made the application for the grant funding. When we were successful, our project team increased to include um, the practice development team, the nursing practice development team here in the hospital, who were hugely supportive to the concept, as well as um, the CNM3 who manages the healthcare assistance within the hospital. That's that one, wasn't it? Yeah. Next slide. Oh, Next slide, Lucy, meeting. please. So... <coughs> As I said, the background was the verbal feedback we had both from staff and from patients themselves. Um, and I suppose we know that not everybody is comfortable with delivering end of life care and that the knowledge base for, for different pe for people is individual. And we wanted a standardized um, level of care. And what we wanted was that our staff would will be comfortable and confident. And I know that's a huge ask. And I'm not saying that it's one we achieved, but we certainly achieved it with our 30 champions. And we hope that that will have um, a fishbone effect, that it will feed out into other staff. Um, what, we, what we knew was that staff were very good at using the resources. So they were able to do something that was there, but maybe not all staff were at the same level of comfort. And then even when they were being used, they were being used, but maybe people didn't feel so comfortable around what they had to do other than put in the resources. Um, as I said, we have huge cultural diversity amongst both our staff and the wider community who use the service. Um, and um, we would have the, I've said that already, the continuous review from our ADONs um, and so on. Um, 
So now, and I suppose the other thing I do need to say is the pandemic had a huge effect. It changed the shift on how we delivered end of life care. So um, parts of it had come back, but we were in kind of um, a fluctuation. So now we're trying to straighten that. And I suppose that was part of the context of the study day as well. So now I'm going to hand you over to Vivian. Thank you, Anne, and good morning, everyone. So um, at this stage then, I suppose our focus was in order to be effective, we needed to have some sort of measures that would actually prove that what we were doing was actually going to have an impact both at the ward level and across the culture in the hospital of people's experiences with death and dying as well, which for us is very important. And it's something that we've built on from this particular um, initiative to actually go a little bit wider um, regarding end of life care. So um, I have to say Lucy was very supportive and instrumental to us for this part because neither Anne nor myself were familiar with using a um, Mentimeter, which was actually what we had um, agreed that we would use to actually um, monitor and measure pre study day knowledge of end of life and there were 12 questions that were asked and we were going to then do one post the actual day itself and compare and contrast which Anne will refer to later on in this presentation and our last one that we'll do will be six months after the study day to see if there is a long-term positive impact from what was um, learned on the day so as you see from the presentation here our outcome was that we would increase confidence skills and knowledge the end of life champions around end of life care and we will check that six months afterwards, increase awareness among hospital staff to the standard of care that we do want to um, deliver across the hospital, regardless of any wards that people are on. Because always traditionally, there's been specific wards that people say, oh, it's great care there and great care there. And we didn't want it to be dependent on certain staff on duty. We want that standard across the entire hospital. So regardless where people touch the service in their admission and end of life, they would be guaranteed a good standard of care. Um, participants were asked and we also thought that it was very good to demystify our mortuary because a lot of staff would be given advice to families out of ours as well you know your relative will go to the mortuary and then the undertaker will be in contact but they had never been to the mortuary they didn't understand the workings they had apart from meeting our mortuary technicians who may have collected the deceased during the day they never had any interaction so this actually was very good to promote relationships across the two departments and actually to um, open up their eyes so that they saw and we Anne has done a lot of work prior to my coming into this post and we have a very lovely um family area and viewing area you know for need when needs be and it was to demystify and take all of that away from them so that actually was a very successful part of what we did for our um our particular study day the self-assessment as i have mentioned and the use of badges and in this day then as well we had a practical session and we will come to the timetable very shortly so not only were we given them theory delivered by our colleagues who actually are in each of the areas that um, end of life care touches in the care of a patient and family and um, we also then were able to do kind of scenarios and we had our nurses doing role play and that was also very it was fun because we wanted to make a fun element but it was also a very good way of demonstrating good care and what happens when maybe it isn't so good and what the challenges would be um, from a communication point of view so i'll hand over to Anne for the next slide thank you lucy So oh, the PDA SA cycle, and I, I suppose it was um, in preparing for this morning's presentation, we didn't have much um, thinking to do to decide how we would describe this. So we were fortunate we got our grant awarded in October. We thought, no bother, we'll have this done by the end of the first quarter. No problem at all. We booked a venue. And I suppose one of the big things that because we had um received the award it gave us um a bargaining tool so we were able to go to management and say we have this much money will you match it we're not looking for money we're just looking for staff so that was huge for us and in fairness we had huge support from management they could see the value of the day and they were very willing to back it but so we went off and booked the venue because you know venues are hard to get and we had a lovely venue in Cree, which is just 10 minutes walk from the hospital. But when we went back then and started talking about staff being released, we hadn't allowed enough time for rostering. So 
we we deferred and we actually had the day on April the 29th. So, but the advantage of all of that was it actually gave us more time. When we came to ordering the famous badges, we couldn't get them from the original supplier. So had we been doing it on the 14th of March, we wouldn't have had a badge. And again, Lucy wrote in and found us a supplier who was able to help. And the other thing that we hadn't fully appreciated was the amount of time it was going to take in completing the pre-attendance criteria with the champions. We did a lot of one and one on them. So firstly, we had um, permission from our Don to grant everybody the, state, the study day. So then we wrote to each of the clinical nurse managers and asked them to nominate the champions. So where there were champions, there were a few areas where there wasn't champions but we did get champions from all areas in the end. So we succeeded where we had failed for months prior to this, trying to get a champion. We now had a champion from each area. So then we wrote to the champions and said, you've been nominated, so this is what you need to do. But because some of it was HSE emails and not everybody looks at their HSE email, we had to do a little bit of follow-up. So we didn't fully appreciate the amount of time that that was going to take. So we were very glad it was April the 29th and we were able to do it. So that for us was the big learning in it. Um, at the same time, I think it was very helpful to have had a set date because otherwise it could still be something waiting to be done. So to have a time frame, we had to work within it. And realistically, then we modified it when it was necessary. So that was the PDSA cycle. Is there anything you want to add to that? No, no, that's Yeah. Next slide. So please, Lucy. And I'm going to hand you back to, to Vivian Anna and she'd talk about the agenda. For the day. So our, our, our next key part then was what we were going to fill this magical day with to actually gain the interest and achieve learning. Um, and that's when we then, as Anne said, we pulled in our um, nurse practice development, our ADON for HCAs and some other um, colleagues who we would link quite closely with, like the chaplain, um, our psychologist who's in oncology to do communication section, obviously our palliative care CNS, who was very um, much part of all that we were doing. Um, and why we want to actually really demonstrate, and this is what Anna and I are both very passionate about and focus on, that end of life care is more than just the palliative care CNS's role. There's a generalist end of life care, which is across the whole hospital. So while we did have our colleague and um, the CNS and palliative care there, we wanted everyone in the, you know, in our 30 champions to actually feel that they have a role and can influence good end of life care across the hospital. So um, so we put a bit of time, and this is probably, I don't know, maybe our fifth draft is what we agreed in the end. And we were down to like, that's two minutes over from that one. And that knocks on five minutes here and another five. And we ended up with half an hour too much. And, you know, so we, it really was fine tuning. And as Anne said, that fine tuning don't underestimate the, the requirement and the work that goes into doing all of that and trying to coordinate across all wards, day shifts, night shifts for our 30 champions to get them to do the pre-learning beforehand. And then um, our mortuary visit. Initially, we had a mortuary visit scheduled into our agenda because as we thought, a bit of fresh air during the day, walk up to the mortuary and come back at a, a scheduled time. But actually that would have added half an hour to the day, if not longer, um, because people would dilly and dally through human nature. So we made it a requirement that they actually would do the mortuary visit pre the course and it was actually checked and signed that you know one of us would, would actually go and meet with them and we also from the toolkit that was in place at the time i know there's an updated version since we focused in on chapter two and we sent them that chapter to actually read it which is on communication so there was a little bit of pre course learning because we really wanted them to feel that they weren't just turning up and it was a, a dos day sometimes people think we really want them to feel that we wanted them to contribute and to feel part of something new and exciting now some of them had attended final journeys which is absolutely fantastic but we wanted this particular study day to be different that it's site specific and they would hear like in, in my role in fairness the role of the coroner and sudden unexpected deaths and post-mortems that's a lot of the work i actually do with families and not just sort of the follow on ongoing signposting, which is very important. So that was an awareness, I suppose, that we realized afterwards that they fully got a bit clearer. And likewise with Natalie Hessian, who is our principal psychologist in um, oncology services. She did a wonderful communication exercise with them. Um, and that actually was very well um, 
enjoyed by all of them as well. And Father Sean, who's our hospital chaplain, and um, he did a very nice session with them as well, and it opened their eyes that even though he is, you know, a Catholic priest, they are a little bit more interfaith nowadays than they might have been. We don't have a pastoral care in the hospital currently, um, but the role of the chaplain is a very important one as well. So there was a lot from that point of view, and Anne will present the second half of the day, which is the afternoon with the group scenarios um, now. Can you go back to the previous slide for a minute, too? Lucy, please? Just, Vivian, on our um, timetable, we've left out the practical. We've somehow lost a piece, but just yeah. to mention it, because I, I do think it was very effective. We did a role play. So we put a, we put a patient into the bed, literally, um, and we did it badly and very badly. And, you know, while we had a lot of laughter around it because it was so bad, we actually had positive learning as in we were all able to say absolutely unacceptable and then talk about the challenges in trying to make um, care good. So just to mention that piece. So then one thing that what did come up in the middle of one of our planning meetings was where were we doing a bit of self-care in it? And as Vivian has said, we were literally down to seconds. And I know I said, we haven't time. Sorry, now we can't do it that day. No way. And then the guilt got me. I thought, oh, this is terrible. We're asking them and we're taking them out and we're not looking after them. So I contacted our colleague in Healthy Ireland and I said to her, would you have any lunch vouchers or cups of coffee or could you do anything or give us maybe, you know, we have a thing here in the hospital where there's walks that people can do at lunchtime. And I have to say, she came up trumps. She brought a goodie bag for everybody in the audience, which included a coffee voucher. And they got lovely um, Healthy Ireland lunch boxes and jackets and all the stuff that we get everywhere and biros but it was just like children santi had come early and everybody had something and there was one for everyone in the audience and you know if people never use them it did give them kind of oh you're valued yeah. so it did lift people so then in the afternoon we went straight into group scenarios and as vivian said we had a local funeral director, we had somebody from the mortuary, we had Vivian in her role as briefment officer, we had a social worker, and we had our colleague from medical records in relation to death registration. And we wrote five different scenarios, which weren't real, but were very um, similar to what happens in real life. So we had somebody who was culturally diverse with poor English collapsed at two o'clock in the morning. We had a young man who was 18 and wanted to go home to die, but wasn't well enough to go home. Um, we had an itinerant lady with 16 children who had a cardiac arrest at two o'clock in the morning. And we had a young mother who came in with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And I can't remember the fifth one. The but, oh, the elderly yes. couple. Yeah. So he was the carer and now in hospital. So she's at home. So then we gave five groups, each had a different scenario. And we said to them, this is what are you going to do? We're not talking about your clinical care now. What can all these people that I've just mentioned do for your patient and help you to support your patient? So they had, it was like speed dating. They had 10 minutes with each rep. And then when that finished, they then had 10 minutes to put their points together and each group fed back. And it was powerful. I think the fact that all the scenarios were different really helped. And there was a huge discussion and an honesty. And for some of our um, international colleagues, I think to see that Irish people struggle with the same thing kind of demystified something. So we hadn't expected that to come out of it, but it very much did. And it was it was electric. The power in the room was absolutely. And even for our facilitators, they felt that they learned. So there was a very frank, honest discussion afterwards. I suppose the one thing there, we were very conscious at the time and we had a great bell ringer who didn't um, do it timidly and we moved everybody on after the 10 minutes. And in fairness, they had plenty of time in the 10 minutes um, and everybody was able to feed back. And again, they had 10 minutes to feed back. And that ended the day, really. Um, we did. We asked them to do the evaluations and they did. Lucy, if you move on now to the next slide, please. So... Um, this is just one we the Vivian mentioned the Mentimeter. There was 12 questions on it. And obviously I'm not going to give you 12 slides, but the red is is the, the knowledge level about end of life care pre. So we got them to grade it um not confident, need support, competent, and very confident. And you can see that in the post, my not confident has more or less disappeared and 
you know, the level of confidence has risen. And as Vivian mentioned, we plan on doing this again in October because that will be six months to see where they're at with it. So that's our measure. Because I suppose the one thing Vivian and I would often talk about in struggles, it's very hard for us to fit the, the fluffy stuff into boxes. So this is actually something concrete we have. And just, I'm not going to bore you all, but just one of the questions we asked them to rate their knowledge of the role of the bereavement liaison officer was one. So the collective or the average was 3.3 pre and that shot to 9.1 after the day. So that's somebody they're meeting day in, day out throughout the hospital. And yes, that learning could go. And then the other one that I think is of note is the death registration process. So, you know, staff are picking up the phone all the time. Families are looking for death certs. And that learning went from 2.7 to 8.4. And then with our mortuary college colleagues, like that was just, and I think it was very good for the mortuary technicians as well as the pathology technicians. They kind of got a G up out of it all. That was another side effect that was good. Their level of learning in re relation to that role went from 3.6 to 9. And the chaplain, it went from 4.1 to 9.2. So everything doubled or more. So for us, that was huge. And then just the final slide, Lucy, is just a picture of everybody on the day. And you can see from the beaming smiles, even though half of them didn't want to be in a photograph, they did actually stand in to mark the day. So thank you, everybody. And apologies about the deficit in technology.